Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank the Academy and the Planning Committee for inviting City to present its mobile clinical trials program and specifically decentralized clinical trials. Um, for those uh, who ha are not familiar with uh, the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative or City, we are a public-private partnership that was co-founded by Duke University and the US FDA. Um, all different stakeholders that you would envision are part of City, so that would include regulators, patient groups, IRBs, academic medical centers, pharma biotech device CROs. And we're really proud of that. We have uh, more than 80 members, um, but in addition, there are hundreds of other organizations that represent these stakeholders and others involved in our work. This is important because when I present the recommendations, you'll notice that many of the individual perspectives mentioned yesterday are actually incorporated in our recommendations, and that's very intentional to bring all the different perspectives together and come up with consensus on um, ways to move forward. The mobile clinical trials um, program was started several years ago, and it was actually started um, at the request of FDA or the suggestion of FDA, and Leonard was one of the key people involved in um, making that suggestion. At the time, and I hope this is no longer true, FDA was um, viewed wrongly as kind of a barrier, and our experience has been the exact opposite, that they really embrace and want to figure out how to do innovative clinical trials. So the purpose of the Mobile Clinical Trials Program was to develop recommendations that would actually um, support the widespread adoption and use of mobile technologies, and in particular, in regulatory um, submission trials. Um, and the program has four different projects. Uh, the first one that finished its recommendations last summer was on novel endpoints. And those recommendations focused on novel in two different ways. One is endpoints that we can now have because we have technology um, and uh, a pathway for how to get those validated. And the second are existing endpoints, but we can collect the information in a different way because of technology. The second project focused on the technologies themselves. So these recommendations are things like how do you select a device? How do you think about data quality? What um, are the implications for the regulatory submission process? Those recommendations were released in July. And our most recent set of recommendations and the one I'll speak with you about today are decentralized clinical trials. Our fourth project, Cindy actually uh, gave you a preview of, and that is our project around engaging patients in sites. There was a recognition that um, it's really important to understand how patients and uh, investigators in sites view the opportunities and the challenges of applying technology in clinical trials, and our recommendations will aim to address the feedback we receive from those groups. The decentralized clinical trials team thought about um, what were actually the benefits of using this. And you'll notice, uh, building upon the theme of yesterday, that almost every one of the benefits they highlight really talks about how do we engage with participants and really shifting our thinking to having them be the focus, whether we're talking about recruitment or the actual in-trial experience. The recommendations themselves have six different parts, and I'll go through and highlight some of the um, messages and recommendations in each of these areas. Beginning with um, protocol design, one of the key messages is something we heard a lot about yesterday, which is this is really not an all or nothing approach. You don't either have a decentralized trial or a traditional trial. There are a lot of different um, ways that you can approach having elements of decentralization, and also you could actually have a hybrid where you have both traditional sites as well as some elements of decentralization. Um, second related to protocol design, and this is a biggie, is engaging the key stakeholders in the design process. This is also a theme that is reflected in many of our recommendations on other clinical trial topics, but it's particularly important here. Um, the standards shouldn't be higher for decentralized clinical trials, but just to reiterate earlier um, speaker comments, you need to think about what's different, and then you need to plan for that 
and make sure that protocols and SOPs to the extent applicable address those. But these are very doable as we've heard. A key stakeholder to include is actually the regulatory bodies. And for the US trials, that means FDA. The um, FDA has a number of established pathways to meet with regulators, both within the CEDAR and within the device division, and we've actually outlined some of those in the recommendations so that people who aren't familiar will have um, a resource in addition to the uh, FDA directly. We also have heard a lot about examples of people using decentralization, and so we encourage people to actually talk about to people who have done this before. And whether that's a sponsor or, or an academic research or vendors, there are people out there who are resources so you don't have to relearn the lessons that they've already learned, but really help the field move forward by building upon them. Another aspect of our recommendations um, talks about telemedicine and state licensing. And when this project was initially formed, it was actually called the Legal and Regulatory Barriers Project. The idea being that there were perceived and actual legal barriers to these trials being done. But as the project progressed, it became increasingly clear, um, in part from changes in the environment, that there weren't barriers, that these trials were very possible. But there are some legal issues that you have to work through when you have these trials. And one of those is state licensure. Um, generally, uh, physicians or healthcare providers have to be licensed in the state they practice as well as the state where they see patients. So when you think about the level of decentralization you want or access to patients, um, there's a couple of things to consider. Do you want to have investigators in each state? Do you want to look for investigators who are licensed in multiple states? Or do you want to contract with a vendor who has a network of investigators already in place that you could tap into? The, the laws are not only state by state, but they can change. So um, you do have to be aware of what the laws are. There are a couple ways you can do this. One is an online resource, which is the Center for Connected Health Policy, which maintains um, a website that you can go to and find the information directly. Um, some organizations prefer to do the analysis themselves, um, either with their internal or external staff. Another aspect of the regulations which um, Leonard actually spoke about quite eloquently was the um, health care providers. Um, and again, depending on whether you're talking about a sub-investigator or whether you're talking about a phlebotomist, they may or may not need certain levels of understanding about, for example, GCP or billing of um, clinical trial activities versus practice of medicine activities. So thinking about those things up front is important. And um, just to highlight the variety of tasks that you could delegate, it could be something as um, simple as training a participant to receive the drug directly, or it could be actually doing clinical assessments. And the types of training or knowledge that people need um, based on their delegated responsibilities um, will be impacted by the function they do. Drug supply chain is another area of our recommendations, and here, too, state laws can vary. In addition, um, I understand there are also some FDA um, regulations in this area that aren't as recent and may not specifically address decentralized clinical trials, but to Leonard's point, um, you know, have a discussion with the regulators about how to apply the applicable um, regulations in your particular trial context. It's also important, um, this was touched upon yesterday as well, that the drug supply chain needs to be well documented so everybody understands what it is and what their role is in it. Um, some particular parties who need to understand that are the investigators, IRBs, and regulatory agencies. And here too, um, there are people who are organizations that do this. So. Think about whether or not you want to tap into an existing resource or whether it makes more sense for you to manage that internally. 
investigator delegation and oversight is highly protocol specific. Um, there is a very practical issue about routine practice of medicine versus clinical trial related activities. And here again, we don't need to increase the standard because we're talking about clinical trials. We just need to think about what's different with decentralized clinical trials and what, how that needs to be taken into account for planning a particular trial. Uh, Leonard touched upon the delegation authority considerations and responsibilities and thinking about who um, belongs on a 1572. And this is another area that's really worth talking to the regulators about in the protocol development phase. And finally, um, safety monitoring. And again, this is highly protocol specific. And again, we don't want to increase the standard because we are using some decentralized uh, activities. We do, however, need to think about what is different, what the implications are, and whether or not people have information to execute the safety monitoring in an appropriate way, and if not, how we make certain that that actually happens. Um, so for example, if yesterday there were some trials where patients directly received the investigational drug. What does a patient do if they have a potential adverse event? Is there a central resource they contact? Is there a local provider? If it is a local provider, then the sponsor or researcher needs to really think in advance about who those local providers can be, set up the relationship so that that's in place when an adverse event um, situation arises. Um, and like all studies, you need a safety monitoring plan, but in the case of decentralized clinical trials, you may want to think about the plan differently and certainly the escalation and communication pathways um, and what specific implications there are there. So thank you. Oh.